kick off this second series of I Am, we're getting back together with our friends at High Performance Podcast. A few years ago, I was invited by Jake Humphreys and Damien Hughes to join them on their show. I thoroughly enjoyed the experience, so we decided why not go there again to see what's changed in the way we see life, ourselves, how we perceive others, and of course, that magical power we possess to create. In the gap between the first recording when I didn't have a clue what a podcast actually was, and today when I'm already one series into my own, there's been plenty of shifts for me, especially in my understanding and my relationship with potential. The guys, they've been diving deeper and deeper into that same beautiful but seemingly elusive zone of genius, so we have plenty to share. We used this awesome little catch up to swap insights and also took time to share a few clips from our own guest interviews too. On top of that, we just had a nice moment following our passion, letting the conversation go wherever it wanted to into some pretty surprising places. I'm really enjoying hearing from anyone listening in. So if something arises in you, thoughts, feelings, or anything that you feel you want to know more about, do not hesitate to email me uh, on hello at iampodcast.co.uk or just leave a comment in the review section on Apple Podcasts. Today, though, it's all about the guest and a chance to hear their wisdom, their learnings, passions, and stories. It was a beautiful experience to record with these guys again. I hope you can find something in there for you too. Thanks so much for listening. I'm Johnny Wilkinson, and this has been I Am. Well, gentlemen, here we go again. <laughs> Round two. Indeed. indeed. <laughs> um, so I listened back to the first time we got together and, and chatted. Have you both done the same? Yeah. Yeah, it's not my usual style, but I did for the sake of, uh, of recapping. Yeah, I did. Thoughts? I thought it was immense. I said to Johnny before we started recording, I think you were the Trojan horse. You were the perfect person to come and deliver this message because you've reached the summit of your chosen discipline and then to come back and with the messages that you did was really powerful. Well, I tell you what, for those of you that are listening to this and you, uh, you haven't heard the conversation that we had the first time around, here's just a few minutes of the kind of things that we discussed. See what you think. I look at the childhood experience and I remember from my own that you're able to become whatever you need to become to make the most of every moment. Like the child says, I'm going to be an astronaut. They are an astronaut. They're not me pretending mm -hmm. to be an astronaut. They become an astronaut because there isn't that sense of this is who I, who I really am. And therefore I'm pretending they haven't got an idea of who they are yet. So they can be anything they want, which means they can engage fully in any moment. The imagination is vibrant because there isn't this solid path to who I've become. Yeah. The thing is, though, is that that childhood experience for me, in my exploration of, of things, is, is unconscious. It's an unconscious freedom, which means it can be lost, and it is lost, and it's influenced by the outside. And by me being falling into that cycle of trying to become someone, that self-importance of wanting to know myself and knowing how the world works, is that that's the path towards going back to that childlike experience, but consciously. So without the, the experience for me of suffering the mental health stuff, there was no way of going back there consciously. And there's no other route but to the only way to go back to being free of the identity of who I become, you know, this stuff is, is to, I want to say, just let it go. But essentially what that means is it's got to die. I made an analogy that about how when I was younger, I'd be like, oh, you know, playing a World Cup final, that's important. And now, you know, the idea about doing the washing up would have been like, don't you dare. And now I'm like, I love doing the washing up. And he couldn't believe it. It was like, it's rubbish. I said, well, what is it you love about? What did def define tr being a triathlete to me? And he was saying about doing the run and then the swim and then the cycle and whatever. I said, okay, right now, break that down for me. What are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm moving my body to get to a goal. I said, right, what are you doing when you're doing the washing up? Moving my body to get to a goal. So why is one good and one's bad? Why because of outside opinions and influences, I suppose. Because of old ideas that, would, yeah. that, that I've decided that this is something yeah. I like doing because I plug into this because this is what I enjoy doing. So all those, it's a really tricky one. And there's obviously going to be likes and dislikes, but whether or not you fully yeah. engage comes down to how you are on the inside. Does that make lifting a World Cup more important than doing the washing up? No. No. No, that's my decision. If I, if I choose to be a World Cup winner, 
because I've lifted a World Cup, that's going to be my next limit. Because when I'm a World Cup winner or I'm a rugby player that won the World Cup, now I'm a guy that's walking around being the rugby, rugby that wins the World Cup. And what happens when England win it again? I'm like, oh, I'm a less important guy who won a World Cup just the same as the other guys. Mm. And now next time England are playing, I'm like, oh, I hope they don't win it. But I hope they do really well because I work the guys, but I hope they don't win it. It's like, no, it doesn't work that way. If I'm a rugby player, when I finish playing rugby, I'm a less of a person. But if I'm a nobody, so this unveiling of the, or, or this ra- unraveling of these old ideas to, to allow the choice for a new one just means I'm going back from a someone to a no one. What do you think when you listen back to it? I, I listened to it this morning, actually. And it, yeah, it's really interesting. It just, for me, as with all things, we were actually speaking in that interview about when he used to do the after-match analysis and you'd watch yourself on the video. And I spoke about coming to a new perspective where you just, you're seeing someone else with a degree of objectivity, which allows you to have a little bit of a connection to the emotions and an understanding of a bit more about that person, but you still have the objective ability to view it as just pure opportunity to learn without taking on board all the, you know, the the cringing parts of it. And occasionally during listening to it, I found myself going, why am I up here? Why are my shoulders tense? And I'd be like, ah, and it's interesting, but most of the time I'd, it sounded like someone else, but someone I know. Really? Yeah. Not, Why is that, I think? Just because I think, the, for me, the evolutionary perspective is that there's a connection with who I've been in the past and where I've been in the past, but I don't identify with it yeah. as part of necessarily me, which allows me, I think, to to be reborn moment to moment. And that's the freedom, I think, of being able to not have to... Yeah, my whole life before that was about holding on to everything as part of who you I mentioned in that in that interview about the you know the CV on your way up to the pearly gates and being like, look here, check my check out my highlights DVD. You know, <laughs> have you got a player? It'd be I can a good DVD on. to be <laughs> fair. <laughs> some of it would be, <laughs> some of it would be. But now now the the ability to fully engage in this moment requires not a dissoci- you know, a dissociation in terms of like cutting off, but it requires a an, a disentanglement mm. in terms of that identification doesn't mean you sort of somehow go I can't think about that anymore and that's no longer me it's just there's an understanding that says that belonged there to then it belonged to that me it's no longer necessarily relevant to this me and that's that's a that that sort of clarity allows for what's in this moment to really come through you know um you know the phrase hold your beliefs lightly yeah I th- I now I listened back as well this morning on my way here, and I was I wasn't embarrassed. I was like, I was slightly disappointed in myself. Like. <laughs> because <laughs> what a great what a great line to open up with. <laughs> Let's hear more. Because I just like I thought that I was I thought I was brighter than I. <laughs> I thought like I was really connected to that conversation, and I was really sort of like understanding you and where you were coming from, what you were saying. But now I listen back to it, and I guess it's like, it's an example of how much I've grown in the time making these podcasts since we recorded that, that what I thought then was connecting and understanding is a million miles away from what I now see as connecting and understanding. So the bit that leapt out for me was when you were basically saying, you know, I had to be perfect, I had to be brilliant, and all of that would mean that I would be, you know, leaving a legacy and how wonderful that would all be. Now I realise that that's a total nonsense. And then I was kind of finding myself still pushing you on the fact that you needed all of the failings and you needed all of the struggle and the strife and the mental anguish and all those things to be successful. I couldn't get myself away from, yeah, but you were successful. But now I realise that if that doesn't make you happy... It doesn't matter anyway, does it? I'm probably going to play devil's advocate to this because listening to the interview I sort of mentioned just before we started that I, I hadn't listened to it back and I thought you guys did a brilliant job of of kind of just sh- sort of guiding and, and moving it and, and just expanding it, opening it here, whatever all that stuff. I thought it was brilliant. So I didn't pick up on any of that at all, nor would I. The second part of this is I actually think you're onto something with what you were saying at the time and it's relevant again now. Because perhaps something that's continued in my exploration of this is that there's an understanding that I used to maybe come to the conclusion or an assumption around the idea that when you're doing your your work, you know, that, that you're meant to do, what you're born to do, that it's always some kind of absolute joy. And that 
these things about achieving they don't mean anything but but they they do and that's what i mean about the memory side is you don't cut it off being like it meant nothing what's the point it means everything it does mean to me it's a reality you're winning the world cup because it serves in so many ways it served me in my journey as you said it it serves other people in their if they're supporting England, they love that journey and other teams, you know, that disappointment and whatever it be, who knows what kind of dynamic it, it involves itself in with everyone else. But the thing is, is it's just, it's, it doesn't carry with you. It's yeah. everything you're trying to achieve now is important. You mentioned in that interview we did about desires and goals, and this is part of it. If you suddenly say, oh, well, the happiness isn't going to be at the end of it, then why would you do anything? But actually the passion of self-expression needs a direction in order to have that passion and self-expression, that direction is exactly what you're talking about. So yeah, to have a dream and to have a goal, but just to not get caught up on this idea that you're gonna arrive at that goal. We spoke about this before, that you're gonna get there and that this goal becomes more than a journey. This goal is simply a pointer. And when you do it through desire and, and it means something to you, the pointer becomes more accurate and more powerful in terms of where your next opportunity is when you're doing stuff you don't really care too much about you don't get much back in terms of where's my big moment but when you really care about something you get resistance everywhere mm -hmm. which points you at well what next you know how do i open up well all you have to do is care about something and go for it yeah. and you know whatever it is will point you exactly where your next opportunity is but to have that calling it means something and you're, and you're supposed to go and do it. It's what, what, you know, that was the work I was born to do at that time and how I was doing it was how I was born to do it. It's not for me to interfere in that now. See, I found it really interesting that the ripple effect that followed from our initial interview, Johnny, that like we initially got some criticism from people that said, why didn't we delve into that 2003 World Cup win in more detail? Why didn't we push you to describe those moments? And I think people felt disappointed that we didn't, bring you back to that person you were then. Yeah. And I think it's a powerful message for them to hear that that mattered to you, yeah. but you've evolved beyond that. I think so. And, and I sometimes consider myself to be a bit f sort of almost flippant or a bit overly trite with those things. Because when people ask me about it now, I'll tell it through the eyes and the energy and the emotion of exactly where I am now, which means I never tell that story the same. When I was younger, more soon after the event, when I feel like I was more locked in a tighter cycle of reinforcing old ideas, I started to tell it very similarly. You know, a year or two between it, be like, well, this is what happened. But now you ask me an, an hour between, I'll give you something different. And it's not because I'm thinking, I'd better tell it differently to be exciting. It's because I can't help it. Something else will come out about it that's linked to something else because there's something so intelligent in how you're feeling now when when i guess maybe i'm able to, a little bit more to give into it and see what it's trying to say and whatever you're asked it comes out if you let it and, and i find that's the bit that's interesting for me is that someone asked me about it the other day i was doing something on online the other day and i was speaking about it and i was thinking as i'm speaking like this is news to me <laughs> <laughs> i didn't even know it happened like that Brilliant. so yeah it's kind of it, i i agree it's it's nice to go over these things but What's more exciting to me is, is you think, wow, look how I'm telling it, not look what I'm telling, yeah. but look how I'm telling it and where's that come from? And geez, isn't life amazing that that constant shifting and, and moving is, is always happening. I, let me just take you back to something that you said about the struggle is in some ways because like something really matters to you and it's your calling at that time. So sometimes I get frustrated with high performance at like, and everyone that works on it will know this, like the speed at which things happen, the speed of action. I go on all the time, like, let's do it quicker, let's do it quicker, let's do it quicker. And then I get annoyed with myself because we haven't changed the world in the last five days. Yeah. And even with parenting, my wife will tell you the same. Like, I can be quite hard to live with because I care so much that, you know, I want everything to be perfect today. When we finished our last conversation, do you remember we were talking about, we thought that struggle and, and falter and challenging and getting punched in the guts led to a great moment and actually you realized and, and it was a great moment on the podcast that it just leads to more of that but are you actually also saying that sometimes that can be an indicator of how much you care about something and it's kind of an inevitability it's a byproduct of really wanting it to be great if you didn't care then that's probably the what almost worse i feel for me in my life and this is particularly 
pertinent for maybe some of the stuff I've gone through in the last couple of years is that you keep meeting the same stuff until you get what you're supposed to get from it. But I think there's also, you can look at it the other way, is to say you keep putting yourself up for that situation because you want to get what you need to get from it. So, you know, you keep getting stressed because maybe you haven't quite found what it is that that stress is trying to tell you, but you keep getting stressed because there's an urge to understand what I need to know. Mm -hmm. And it's like anything, you know, why do you keep playing rugby up until a point you say no more? Why yes and then why no more? What is it that keeps you saying yes? Because that desire is funny. You wake up in the morning, you're just like, nah, it's coming to an end for me. But the morning before, you're like, let's go. So what's what's happening at that level? There isn't a cutoff line when someone says, you've reached 35, it's time. It's like, no, it's not. Some people go to 40, they go for it. Some people are still playing vets rugby and, you know, and, and putting themselves out there. And some people call it their mid-20s. But there's a degree of this surrendering to that, voice that says you know there's this is what my mission is the danger is that you start to think i know what the outcome of my mission is supposed to be and that's where you get caught in that frustration where maybe it's saying i just know i'm supposed to be doing this until i know i'm not and i know that through my passion it keeps bringing me here and you can say oh i'm getting over obsessive and i'm doing this but there's also part of that which is saying i've got work to do and the joy is not knowing what the work's supposed to achieve, that's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to play my part. And playing my part means staying in my lane. And my lane is bring the intention, bring the presence, bring the joy, bring all the emotion, bring me. But once I start getting out my lane and thinking, so what's the universe trying to achieve with me here? You're like, that's not my business. If it was, I'd be in the universe's shoes and not in mine. But then that throws up a really fascinating question, Johnny, of because there's lots of people that listen to our podcast and to yours that are searching for that passion, that sense of purpose. And I'm intrigued, what kind of questions were you asking yourself to discover what yours was? I think that's been very relevant after career, because during career from age of year dot, I knew. And after career, you kind of go, stop. And then as many people do, you find yourself in a space saying, I've got free time, let's go on holiday for a bit. And you're on holiday for a bit, and then suddenly you're like, well, this isn't the answer. Much the same as we were talking about retirement and all those kind of things. There is no space where you say to desire, thanks very much, you've done great for me, but I'm going to live without desire now. Yeah, there's nothing worse. So that desire is kicking in, but it hasn't got the, the, the channel to go down. And I think I'm constantly referring to things we've uh, sort of, people have inspired me with on the podcast. But there's almost like two voices in there. One that we spoke about is old conclusions and ideas, and it's the it's the more powerful voice. It's the mind-based voice that's trying to logically work everything out according to an old formula that's been building, and, and it's deducing and it's calculating joy and it's and it's sort of um, manufacturing inspiration and aliveness. All of which we were saying, you know, it's not, is it? If you're going to build and you're going to make aliveness, it's not being alive. And then. That voice is very strong. People talk about it, I think, saying, you know, this is a voice in my mind, voice in my head. It's the one that everyone refers to. No one sort of says, oh, that amazing voice I hear. <laughs> they always say it's that voice that gets yeah. me. But that other voice doesn't come in the form of the v verbal so much. It comes in the form of that little feeling. It takes that more attuned awareness to pick up on that voice. And that's the passion one. And it's everywhere, in every moment. There's always a highest excitement in this moment where we're sat here you could be saying right well what have we got in this room we've got three of us and you've got some microphones and you're sort of like well it's not exactly like people would be like well that's not a yacht on the ocean is it <laughs> but you're kind of like well, what's the excitement here but there's so much for me i can't you know put me on a yacht in the ocean i'll be like yeah yeah nice can i go back in that room yeah. because there's so much there but saying for example you're sat in a room or you're on the tube traveling you're like, but there's something there find it What's most exciting? And it might just be the way I'm sitting or the way I'm feeling my body or it might be someone else you look at and you think, interesting. But find that excitement and follow that excitement and as you get used to following that excitement, I, I feel it starts to build into what's underneath it that's trying to call you out and it starts to overpower the other voice which is telling you don't watch out for this, you know, you shouldn't do this, you should do that. The mind-based one, it's the one that speaks about do this. Go the here without the because the mind one is almost like do this because there's a 
a kind of conditional clause to it. If you do this, this will happen. It will it will make you a bit happier. It will make you a bit less unhappy. It will get this person thinking this way. But that inner voice doesn't have any interest in what will come about from it. So what's been the most effective way you've learned to dial down that mind voice and start to recognise those feelings of excitement that might get drowned out? The big shift, if you like, if it's any, in any way possible to articulate, which is not, I almost feel like I'm, I'm cheating this by saying it, but to try and put some kind of words on it would be that the, the three things that really make sense to me are awareness, acceptance, and responsibility. And all of those, the reason they, they are so powerful is they're all infinite capacity. So you, there's no limit to what you can become aware of. And there's no limit to what you can accept. <clears throat> and there's no limit to how and what you can respond to which is why they're exciting. One of those, the first one, the awareness, is exactly that. The The big thing is being able to become aware of a situation and aware of what's happening without entering into it and becoming recruited by it. And that's the difference about finding that voice, is that it's an awareness-based thing. It's not a mind-based logical thing. So hold on, if I sit like this and do this, I'll hear that voice. It's putting yourself completely in that space of and this is where the acceptance comes in fully welcoming lovingly whatever is happening and that doesn't mean involving yourself in it and solving it as i was yeah i've been a big one for that something comes up i, I get recruited by it and i have to try and solve it but by solving it i just feed it i get more of it and the ability to sit with that feeling but not sit with it in a way that says, if I sit with it, it will reveal something to me. Again, that's conditional. So it's a loving, welcoming, unconditional relationship with something that feels horrible <laughs> and feels tough. And that's the difference that then brings about extra awareness. Because where you have previously, as with responsibility, chosen that here ends my ability to respond, there begins my compulsion to react. And where there's reaction, the awareness is also stopped it's about sitting in that and realizing that that everything for me stems from that internal when i say internal it's it's not really internal it's just the the the, the state whether you call it energy or whatever and as we mentioned before that I, I called it before in the interview that we did it was it was all the the podcast we did it was kind of like how i see myself or that relationship with myself but in fact actually if you talk about that it's just a a deep energy state out of that comes how you see feel do and create things and so in order to start having a different relationship of what you see, feel, do and create, you've got to somehow become attentive to the energy. And the closest way to get to the energy is to become aware of those other things. How am I feeling? How am I thinking? How am I seeing things? But without analyzing them. This is the big one. People meditate and they kind of go, oh, I've just got to watch my thoughts. There's one. Why am I thinking that? It's like, no, that's the mind doing its thing. But what if you see a thought and you just, you have such a yes to it that there's no engagement, but there's an awareness of it. And that that kind of, I guess, difficult dimension shift is where you want it to be on the same dimension as feel, do, and create, because it's like, oh, that's tangible, but it's not. It's so, so interesting that things are happening and you're in them, but there's part of you that just has a recognition that I'm not in them. So just sitting quietly, as you say, how do, how do you get into that space? When those feelings come for me, and I, I mentioned about the last two years, you know, I've had, after I spoke to you guys, maybe a couple of years after I spoke to you guys, you know, I, we spoke about being what sort of place you're in, and out of the blue, I'm back where I've been when I was 26, right in the heart of really intense conflict, out of nowhere. You know, like proper shivering, panic, everything. Madness to think that, oh, you know, the, the arrogance of, oh, I'm here and life's great. And then suddenly you're kind of like, oh, God. And of course, everything sort of comes up in that space. Because of that energy state, you think, well, hold on. I'm going to just sit with this. But that ability to sit with something belongs to an energy state, which is already really at ease. So now you're basing yourself in an energy state, which is really conflicted, that you think you're just going to be able to sit in it. But the challenge is such that if it's not really, really intense, it's not a challenge. And I'm sat there thinking, I know what I need to do here, but I can't do it. I am compelled 
down that chain of I'm seeing things the way I do. I am spiked feeling wise. Thoughts are coming up in me that I can't even believe where they're coming from. I'm thinking this isn't me and I'm doing things. I'm thinking I don't want to be doing this, but I have to do it. And I'm in that space where, where I could be you know, a young child again, but I recognize it. And it's so powerful because it's come out the blue. Now we talk about what's my work. I feel like I was asking for this. I'm asking, I want to go into potential. And you get something in you which you recognize from your entire life. And you say, why are you here? It's like, well, what are you asking for? You want to know where your responsibility and your acceptance and your awareness can go. It's like, but this is a large part of what's holding it back. So all these things you speak about when you're feeling pretty good, they come a little bit more easy and you don't really have the depth to it. But then you get the big one that seemed like the big one to me and you say, right, money where your mouth this time. See, because that leads us to a really interesting question that that we pondered at after we first met of, what do you think, Johnny, the rugby player, your potential would have been with the learnings that you now have, have adopted post-retirement? It's an interesting one. I just can't answer it because I know now I could play a damn fine game of rugby as I am now. But physically, I get beaten up very quickly in terms of that contact side of it. And, and I wouldn't have the emotional drive to go and smash people. I don't have passion for that anymore. But I put myself in spaces where I have to go into that element of, you know, there's a bit of an intention and there's people watching and there's people being spoken about and they're holding you in a certain regard or esteem and you're, you have to put yourself on a pedestal and say, right, here I go. And I, I love that challenge but I respond to it very differently than the way I would have done. And when I respond to it this way, I see, I, I feel all of me engaging it in a way that, to sum it up in a tangible way, I breathe out when I'm doing it now. I used to breathe in. I used to hold my breath while I did it. If you can understand everything that means is that I'm expressing myself. I love this. I'm falling into it. Whereas before I was getting through it. <sighs> oh, whereas now it's during the event, I'm just... This is me, this is what it's all about. When I was younger, the work I was meant to do involved how I was supposed to do it. I wasn't doing the work, but doing it badly. The work was how I was doing it. And that's the acceptance that, like I said, with that deeper acceptance I have now and awareness is that when people say, what about going back over stuff you've done and trying to work out the meaning? It's like that inevitability of it was what it was it's deeper than this idea that oh never mind it just was it's like no no it was beautifully intelligently crafted according to levels of in dimensions we have no business entering into but you can easily put it down to oh i was just so stressed when i was young i didn't know what i was doing and i was so into myself but it's like no no, no. that moment is every part of it emotionally every way you're supposed to be it's all connected in such a level that if you if i went in there and went can i just change that bit who knows what would fall apart the whole thing couldn't exist anymore so yeah that that i understand i was supposed to do it the way i did it but if i did it now would i do it the same i couldn't because i'm supposed to do it differently and, and i and i do i do it according to to how i how i feel in the moment and and i give into that a lot more i think look thanks for sharing that over the last couple of years you've struggled with your mental health in 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 various ways and i think that's important for people to hear because i think that I actually had a lot of people say to me, some on Instagram, some of them are friends, they said, oh, I wish I could be where Johnny is because I've had these mental health struggles and I wish I could get to where he's got to and like they were behind me. And I actually, I don't know how you felt, Damien, but we did that interview and I thought, oh, I'm so pleased for Johnny. Like all those struggles and all those issues are behind him. Yeah. He's like, he's done a lot of work and now look where he is. Mm. And then they come back. Yeah, but we, but we mentioned this before. It's the same concept behind getting to retirement and saying, oh, you know, I made it, brilliant, now bring on life. You're like, well, something's missing. The same way that the analogy of going to the fairground is that people queue up for the roller coaster that has nothing but big dips and big rises. No one queues for the flat one or the one that goes gently up on a beautiful curve and then you get off at the top. But no one queues for the one that goes down the whole time because, again, anything without the change gets a bit... It just loses all the things that you really care about. Did you think it was behind you, though, with the amount of work and exploration? And Do you know what? I, yes and no. I thought the way it came, I dealt with. But what I came to understand was that 
I couldn't have done. Even using the phrase deal with it's 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 too much and that it feels like there's this is how things should be. I need to impose that upon how things are. It's not it's not there's the intelligence is actually with the challenge, not with me. And it's for me to let go of my intellectual understanding of how things should be to take on what is coming from the challenge and it's madness i sort of stopped calling it mental health thing just call it crisis moments because we were speaking about how you how you're formed we spoke about that plug forms it but now it's for me it's a case of how you build yourself wherever you've locked in and solidified you'll meet a situation you can't that seems insurmountable you can't transcend if you want to remain or have that part of you remain in place. And in order to transcend it, you have to give. You don't use the other part of you, which is great, to you know, push it out the way, which is kind of what I did by having such an obsession about wanting to understand things and, and, and get to that level of, oh, wow, I get this, and, and I'm understanding this about me and who I can be. But you sidestep the sitting part because you're still doing. You're still doing to get to your being. But another way of putting it would be that there's almost like told about the energy state you have that big energy state and there's bits of it which just rise to the surface because they're not of the same flow of the rest of it so they rise up and when they rise up they come all the time small ones come all the time like you mentioned with frustration it might be a thing about whether it's down to that sense of i don't deserve to have it this way so i'm a bit uh, defensive about that or it might be that my worthiness here and it might be about um you know not feeling like people respect me whatever it might be it's coming up all the time but then there's ones that come up which you almost have to ask what the where's this come from but even finding out where it's come from doesn't actually mean that's gonna get you over it you don't have to find out where it's come from but to sit with it reveals all you need and and the best thing is is that if i say great that's the end of my challenges then that's the end of my growth like i said last time i'm in this to see all i can be this is what that looks like this isn't a wrong path this is the path and if i say no to it then i step off the path as i may have done before i said i sort of said no whilst thinking i'm saying yes and then you you hop back on the path you go this time i'm actually i'm going to see what saying yes sounds like and i sit here now with so much more humility Coming from that awareness, acceptance, and responsibility, also it's a journey of great humility that when you speak, you understand that you're doing your best job. Mm. But to to beware of this idea again that I'm somehow doing well at life. It's like life's life life is just doing what it's doing. And we'll come to what's some one of the one of the things I heard on the podcast, which has blown me away a little bit, which is talking about how we get out of our own way and how we think that our life is about us. Well, should we go there now? We, Let's do it, yeah. Who, who, who so shared it was this? Bernardo Castro, who's uh, an idealist who who's sort of uh, is very much into looking at, at life um, and, and in, in a way dispelling a lot of the materialist concepts. But yeah, the way that he looks at how there is there is individual minds and then there's the collective mind. What we think of it is, is there's individual people and then there's the world. He's saying it's all mind, which is creates, and that mind is obviously you know our individual way of relating to it. And he spoke about life and nature and, and the thing that he you know, blew me away with again was just saying that life is just something that nature is doing. We think our lives about us and we want to take credit for it and we want to own it and guide it. And the way that he explained it, it, it certainly revealed a, or, or, or pointed me at a lot of places where I had some, some interesting creases in my thinking. Life is something nature is doing. And we cultivate, I think, in Western culture, especially the, the, the self-help and well-being uh, part of Western culture, we cultivate a totally absurd idea about what it is to live uh, a good life. It starts from the notion that your life is about you, which if people hear me say this now, they go like, yeah, well, of course, right? Your life is about you. My life is about me. Uh, this is a completely unnatural idea of what life is about. Life is something nature is doing. We are not born in a vacuum. We are a part of nature. We are something nature is doing. So, of course, our lives are not about us. Our lives are about whatever it is that nature is doing. And you can develop the attitude of being in the way of that, or you can develop the attitude of going along with that 
But because we think our life is about us and that we have some kind of moral, almost religious, metaphysical responsibility for being happy all the time, which is utterly impossible and unnatural, we add insult to injury because not only do we not manage to be happy all the time, we feel guilty for not managing to be, to be happy all the time. We think there is something wrong and inadequate with us. And all the while, all there is going on is nature doing what it does. It's just our cultural narratives that sort of get in the way of that and inform us, I would say, wrongly. Uh, about what life is all about and we make it a lot worse on ourselves i think human potential is something that is much more than personal the realization of the human potential begins with noticing something as simple as that noticing our place in nature See, in some ways, that flies in the face of a lot of the things that we talk about, though, on high performance, doesn't it? This get up at five o'clock in the morning, have your world class basics, have your non negotiables, communicate effectively with people every minute of every day. Really, if you look at those things, basically what we're saying is control, control everything, control all the problems. This feels almost like the opposite. As we spoke about with desire, if that's your calling, you know, for it, he goes on to say a bit later on in the episode, he said that some advice that he was given and that's been important to him, was that someone said to him, just allow yourself to be felt, allow yourself to be thought, given this idea that actually if you become almost like a receptive or the receiver of these incredible emotions, instead of thinking you own the emotion, because, you know, I, I've been definitely down that route before of using terminology which has somehow some, sometimes crept into this idea that you choose how you feel which is a, a difficult one because it's exactly what he's saying. I choose to be happy, but I'm not happy. I'm failing. And now I'm feeling even less happy. And now I choose to be happy, but now I'm not working. But actually, that shift in energy comes from getting it. And I think getting it is getting out the way and saying, this is how I'm feeling right now. And just to say, so what if I say yes to this? And quite quickly, it's a bit like anything, you know, you say, oh, this is really troubling me at the moment. Okay, all right. Um, do you want to play a game of this? Yeah, great. Now, you might call it distraction, or you might call it engagement in something else. And then after that, you kind of, how are you feeling? Yeah, quite good. Mm. Someone might say, oh, great. So every time I have a problem, what I should do is go and play this game or whatever. But actually, sometimes that won't work. It's just at that time you find what's exciting to you, or you find a different calling in that voice, and the energy changes. But to actually think that you can stand there and go, right, now I'm going to feel this way, is that if you can, as we said this before, if you can choose what aliveness feels like, it's not aliveness. And that's to think that your potential belongs, and I've, I've said this before, I sort of said, oh, your potential doesn't belong to the stuff around you. It's a really interesting challenge for me. The, the potential doesn't belong to the objects around you. you. You lift a trophy, you're not suddenly a better individual or a, a, an individual with more power. So I was like, your potential's in you. And that's kind of... Yes, that's true in, for me anyway, in some ways, but it's also like your potential belongs to all of this and it comes through you. And in order to feel your potential, you can't control your way to your potential. You can't say, I'm going to get me some of my potential. Watch this. I'm going to get up at five and do this. It's going to get me some of my potential. But actually, if that's your calling to say, I need to get up at five. And as I get up at five and eat my breakfast, I'm going to get out of the way of this experience. So if I'm feeling this while I'm doing it, I'm just going to allow that feeling and let that find its way to making whatever you need to do. The key, because you mentioned about the, the excitement. Now, if you've got excitement, I used to kick for hours. Every day when people were laughing and doing this, I'd be out there kicking in the wind and the rain. But I loved it, deep down. But I also hated it. But that love was that voice of, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. The hate was me saying, I'm in my way. I'm owning this and I should be feeling differently about this. And while I'm kicking, I'm thinking about, you know, how it would be better if this happened. If it better. But actually just going and saying, right, tune into that voice by and tune into it, not by doing more work, but, but actually just letting go. That takes a lot of trust though, doesn't it? Because if, imagine if you're an England rugby player and you go, you know, I'm not going to kick a thousand balls this week. I'm just going to accept that I'm going to get out my own way and still be a great rugby player or... But you can't shift before you're ready. So if someone's saying, I need, yeah, if you said to me when I was 24 or whatever, right, just don't do any kicking today. It's like, but I need to. 
and now you, that could be very dangerous. But actually, if that 24-year-old is saying, I want to be free, I want to feel like this, I'm feeling tight and constrained, I feel tired, and, and I'm just, I'm starting to lose this, my performance is coming down, and that person is, is looking for that opportunity, now that person naturally is opening to it, and it's part of the journey. But if you go to someone who's not in that state and you start suggesting those kind of things, it's not relevant. And I think that's why these podcasts sometimes resonate with certain people and others, because even just in the, you listen to a podcast when you're in a bit survival mode, even me, who this resonates enormously with, if you're saying to me, geez, you know, we're going to be late for this thing and your, your little one needs to be this, we haven't got it done. They're like, hey, listen to this podcast. Like, get out of my way, shut up, <laughs> I'm not interested. But actually it's not to do with the fact that I don't love it. It's just that at that moment, my energy state is right job to do. Mm. If someone's in a very job to do mentality, survival state, which is I was in pretty much my entire career, yeah. these kind of things aren't relevant. But at some point, there's a readiness where you say, actually, you're starting to want this. And that's the inner voice saying, you know, this has been good, but I want to do this in a freedom. Can I just ask how Bernardo then would say you are successful at life in the way that society sees success, right? How would he say you are successful at life if you just get out of your own way rather than do all the things that you know are going to take you to a place of success? I think from a materialistic perspective... I think it's almost like getting out of your own way is not really the point because you're almost trying to put more of yourself in your way by saying, look how big I'm getting, you know, with my new stuff and my new success and people thinking about me. So I think in a way, success is not on that level. He already sort of said, you know, that, you know, I've, I've, this, I've got myself into this position financially. It's like, and I, what am I going to do this stuff for, you know, to make more money? You know, it's like they come to an understanding. It's like, well, it's not the point. But at the same time, when I look at it in a performance perspective with people that I might work with, it just comes down to saying, as we said before, is like when you're in this state, this energy state of total acceptance and awareness and, and an ability to respond, you're just at your best anyway. So you can say, as Dave Orr had said, I spoke to Dave Orr on the, on the podcast and he was talking about saying that if you're just working on expanding, he'd call it about improvement, I'd look at it as expanding, expanding your awareness, expanding your acceptance, expanding your ability to respond, which is your anything from emotional, whatever it is, your activity, you're kind of like, but that's performance. Now, if you go on that journey, that's growth. Expanding awareness, expanding acceptance, expanding responsibility, there's nothing else anyway. You expand those, you're growing. Anything that's possible for you will happen, will unfold within that journey of improvement. If you put the improvement on the back on the on the back burner and say, "I'm going to go get me this without improving," even if you get it, you're going to lose it very quickly because, as you see with teams, you know when they get there, you know golfers or whoever might get to number one and go, "Ah, oh, I did it," and all of a sudden next week it's like, "Oh no, I'm number two. It's that quick. But if you're on that journey of just saying, "It doesn't matter. I'm just here to grow and expand and and find more physical connection and mental connection, emotional connection with everything I do on those deeper levels. Everything that your desire is finding a clearer pathway for more of you to be involved in it. Yeah, there's more of you involved in every activity. And surely that's, is that not the secret of every success? Is like if you're going to do it, the more of you you bring to it, the more chance you are of, of succeeding at it. So, can I ask you about decision making then, Johnny, in terms of your energy in one moment where you might be requested to, to make a decision about a commitment? How do you make that decision? knowing that say three months later when when the commitment arrives that energy will still be similar or or it might have changed i think just going what jake said there just about the the trust side is that you trust where there's excitement um that there's something in it you don't have to know what it is you know often you'll be like well hold on who's there what am i going to get for this and and how many people are going to be there and are they going to do this and they're going to do that but actually you come down to it's like is there that sense of yeah Something tells me yes about this. What Bernardo was saying when I listened to the podcast, it, it it sounded fascinating in terms of that hive mind that, you know, that we're all smarter, like no individual is smarter than, yeah. uh, than everybody. I was wondering, did you ever experience that in your previous life in a, in a rugby environment where you, where you sensed it came close to that, that absolute trust, that just investment in the wider? Yeah, definitely huge amount of trust came about certain moments and, and it, people often talk about earning trust and there is that way of doing it so you get permission for 
for me anyway, if, in the changing room where you've spent so long with people and they've been so consistently on a level where you can really trust what you're going to get from them. And you then give yourself permission to have that kind of like, right, I'm surrendering to you. Someone giving themselves to you is equivalent to someone on the field that you just know they're all in. Because part of the reason I ask you this is, I don't know if this will resonate with you, Jake, is when we interviewed Sia Khaleesi, okay, yeah. and he spoke about the, the South African success, and he attributes that, that Zulu phrase, Ubuntu, I am, because you are. And when he was tearing this to us, it brought our minds back to our conversation with you, which is why I wanted to speak to you around the development of trust. And it seems very similar to what he was speaking about. Of, I'm just going to offer myself to you and make myself vulnerable. Yeah, wow, that's big. And your response is... Yeah. is, is uh, it's a big one, but what a challenge. Because you get a load of guys in a change room where there's so much competition and there's so much of that, a, another version of masculinity, I'm not going to call it the, the toxic version, but there's a lot of that competition and that kind of one-upmanship and need to conquer and 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 rise above and be seen this way and you reference your own self-worth on the basis that I'm better than him so that makes me a, a good player because you're bad and you know and, or you've done something wrong so that means that you know they'll look down on you and i am doing this and i had a good game all that kind of stuff to give all that in to people you know i i got i got dropped or i was i mean i was injured for so many years but i got dropped and whenever anyone played in my position the first game they played in the position that i was playing when i wasn't playing the first one they always got man of the match 95 percent of the time and i used to look and think if I'm deeply honest here, what do I feel about this person? What do I feel about this situation? And my deep honesty would be, I hate it. I don't want them to do well. <laughs> now, now, that would be my deep honest in that moment, you know, being part of a team when you're still playing and someone else is in your position. And I hate this situation. And I, and I feel hard done by, and what do you feel about that person? I feel like I don't want them to have it. And of course, then you say, well, let's have some team spirit, guys. And you go, yes, well done. You're shaking the hand in the changing room going, yeah, looking them in the eye like, well done. Now you just be deeply honest with yourself. You, you'd be better off going, I didn't want you to do well. Yeah. <laughs> I, hate <you. laughs> I hate this situation, honestly. It's killing me. But there's a degree of when you say that I am because you are, there's a deep surrendering where you say, well, let's be deeply honest because what you'll come to in that deep honesty, you'll find out what's holding you back from team spirit. Now, team spirit often belongs to the 15 and not the 23 because you and I've been a part of that sort of the, the the bench when you're sort of there going yeah but you're just like but then there's some guys you watch on a bench who they're incredible and now I can honestly say I wasn't capable of surrendering that much I really wanted it for other people but I was scared and that's that fear drove me to have feelings of being like I'm conflicted now because everything I know about this part of me is saying, love them, love the team, love it for going well. But I was, I was scared of it. I've had a brilliant journey after that in coaching some of these players, you know, Owen Frow, for example, George Ford. These are all such great guys. And I've been forced to, to sort of go into a space where I'm there being like, right, now it's time for honesty. I'm working with these guys. Do I really want the very best for them? And it's an amazing journey. It's got nothing to do with... Oh, you know, it's like unfair this or unfair that, or, or should you be doing that right? It's been that this is my calling. I wanted to coach, now I'm in this position. Part of that calling is looking at them saying, D do I really want this for you? And the answer has been a resounding yes. I want it for you because I know that's also hugely for me. Whereas before it was, I want to control my potential. I want you to do all right, but not too well. I'll give you that much. <laughs> I'll give you the all right. So you, the team can win and you can have quite a good day so you yeah. can sleep all right tonight because I'm a nice guy like that. But don't be stepping into that man of the match territory. And of course they all do because you're looking thinking, well, just the same as you get your lessons over and over again. I kept getting the same lesson. The lesson was, come on, be a team man. Let go of the individual insecurities and trust. Well, let's hear from someone then who's appeared on the High Performance Podcast yeah. previously and in a very different way to you, he was in a solo sport, so it, it was able to be all about him. I'm looking forward to getting your thoughts on Stephen Hendry okay. explaining to us how he would approach it if he had the chance to do it all over again. Have a listen to this. 
people say, oh, you're going to get mad, that's it, that's the end of your career, and all that, you know, you have kids, that's it. Um, and I always fought against that. I was determined to keep practicing. The reason why there's so few people can win relentlessly is is they sacrifice even family to get to, you know, snooker's my life is number one. That, that came first, even before my wife, my kids, everything. Obviously, they ended to the detriment of my marriage and everything. You know, it was all about me. It's very cold, but it has to be that. If I look at all the top sportsmen, individual sportsmen, and many of them are still married to the same women. Very, very few. Very few. Very yeah. few. So uh, obviously, it, it ended up the breakdown of your marriage, and you probably don't see your children as often as you would have done when you were in a house with them every single day. Mm. Would you still have that same approach to life if you did it all over again? Do you think you couldn't have achieved what you did as a snooker player without that? Yeah, definitely. Right. I couldn't have achieved. I couldn't have been the, the, the winner I was, um, and and being. Um, there as well as so here's an interesting one then if you had your time again would you win less games of snooker be at home more and and be married to your wife still and have a sort of family life or is the winning which we spoke about right at the beginning the thing that you feel you were put on this earth to do to be yeah, a winner definitely i mean right. I, there's going to be a lot of people watching us thinking what an what an absolute <laughs> cold son of a bitch but that's yeah that's what I was putting I was putting this uh, to, to win snooker match to win world titles and, and be as dedicated as I was to be the best and yeah given the same decisions I'd, I'd make the same decisions again um, whether that makes me a horrible person or not you know other people can decide that but I for me that's I made and that you're decision you're certain you couldn't have done both who can tell but I don't think yeah. so wow it's great isn't it to hear other people's truths mm. and to know that that's their truth there is no better or worse it's brilliant it's just someone talking passionately about where they are in their own specific journey that has nothing to do with me or mine and and comparing but just to understand it's brilliant hearing someone to talk with such clarity as well i mean like i said it's obviously very tough to be in that world you never appreciate that anyway you see someone just potting balls on the mm. on the table you don't think i wonder what else is happening in life it's like yeah there's a huge uh, a huge amount going on so do we disagree with it or do we just say well that is what it is and it it worked for him i can't disagree with anything i have no basis on which to form an opinion on 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 his world and his life in any way i have huge respect for his sporting performance but but i think it's also i don't know anything about snooker mm. i guess you could relate it to to sort of you know dead, about being a parent, dead ball situation of kicking a ball and maybe parenting but again I just don't have opinions of other people because in all essence I never had family when I was playing mm. and if you ask me do I think I could do it as that person I was I don't think I could have done it either not the way that I parent I parent super all in <laughs> to the extent that when our little one was, was sort of first born I was because I obviously like to train and do all those things still I was doing that two in the morning so I'd be training in the gym at two in the morning it was terrible for my health <laughs> but I was kind of like but I'm not missing a moment yeah that beca that's become my rugby yeah. and so put those two together I'm looking at what he's saying thinking yeah great but I think I, I, I completely get it mm. I think what's interesting for me is that when I work with the players I work with now if I saw them kicking for two hours a day as I did I would have serious questions about the efficiency and effectiveness of it in terms of almost becoming accountable for saying right weekend coming what do you need I need to have trust I need to feel physically fresh I need to um, I need to be excited I'd, be, I'd say okay right so let's start being accountable in terms of this and there'd be old ideas in there. Certainly, I'm just looking at myself now in terms of trust came from hitting an extortionate amount of kicks over. But of course, the more you kick, the more you'll miss. And it may be that your ratios are out. You might get a good day on Wednesday, but you often had an average day on Thursday. And if you're being really honest, what that understanding could do is be like, it doesn't matter how good you are. The next day could be anything. So even all of this is you almost manipulate everything going around you because of the belief you've got in place the belief manipulates everything to fit itself and whether the belief's coming from an unworthiness or a worthiness position it does the same and i'd say well with those guys it's a lot less practice but the practice goes on throughout the entire day the kicking part is 40 minutes maybe an hour depending on when it is during the week 
and and it would be three times, four times a week, three times a week maybe, not six or seven. And the question would be, from an accountability status, is like right, the physical learning of it, that twenty minutes, forty minutes, that's that's probably important to get the repetition and what have you. The underpinning part of it is emotional, mental, and deeper to find that energy that inspires that. And that work's got nothing to do with being on a rugby field. It can be, but it might as well be at home with your family, could be at dinner with your mates, could be two minutes before you go to bed. That work is an enjoyable life journey that inspires the rugby. When I'm with my family, am I, you know, am I operating in that space of inspired and connected? And if not, it's kind of like, but that's my performance. So if I have a day when I'm, you know, I'm sort of like, I really feel like I've, I've surrendered and given in. I've had a brilliant time with my, my family, albeit challenging. Not brilliant doesn't necessarily mean we've been laughing all day, but challenging. But I feel like, you know, I've there, there. And I'd be like, I could also say, that's done great for my kicking. See, that reminds us of, like, again, another interview that so often after we've had our chat with you that we're speaking to other people and we sometimes come back to some of the wisdom that you shared with us originally. And Kevin Sinfield oh, yeah, okay. was a really interesting example for that, that he spoke about needing to be well-rounded as an individual. And the phrase he used was that you have to be a champion at home before you can be a champion on the field. And it was this idea of he did have a young family when he was playing and he saw that as that was part of his potential as a leader in the dressing room was how he could handle his children and deal with wider society, yeah. if you like. Yeah, definitely. But well, I think it's like playing with a, my daughter or whatever. The question is, am I willing to be vulnerable according to what my where my pull's coming elsewhere? Over to this, over to that. Is this going okay? Will this be okay later on? Has that been all right? What about this? What about... Am I willing to surrender that so I could be here fully with my daughter? Is the same question of, I'm about to kick a ball. Am I willing to surrender all that? Will it go over? What will it mean if it doesn't? In order that I can be here fully with my kick. <laughs> but that's yeah. it. Then what else is there in terms of, another word is it, am I willing just basically to surrender my, my mind so that I can be here and know this moment on a different level and it's it's sort of funny i sort of mentioned dave ward was on that he spoke about on the podcast about feel and about how amazingly intelligent that feel perspective is versus the analytical calculation side of the mind and I, you know i use that massively in the work we do but it's so key that you don't have a great time with your child because you you thought through a great time with your child or your wife or whatever you have a great time because you feel a great time. And when you try and tell someone about the great time you've had, you can talk about what it looked like, but you can't get anywhere near what it felt like. Mm. That's the a really, really big thing for me is to get to the feel re- realm where it's where I think all that joy is. You've got to forego the working it out. Again, there's so many light bulbs going off that when people have asked us for sort of, themes that we've seen on our podcast interview i think one of the ones that i frequently cite is the idea of humility and you're not humble because you say you're humble it's a mindset it's a way of being and when we try and explain it to somebody when jake and i will talk to somebody we'll say we see it in three stages that you get beyond the peak idiot stage of having to have an opinion for the sake of an opinion (laughs) And then you enter that valley of humility where you're curious, you're open, you're exploring. And a really good example of that was when we spoke to Dylan Hartley. He spoke to us about his career and the journey that he'd been on. And then we asked him about being a parent because at the time he'd just recently become a dad. And his instant response was, I've never been a parent before. So he didn't have an opinion. He wasn't trying to take his lessons from rugby and apply it to, this is how I'm going to be a dad. Yeah. He was curious of asking us around that. And I'm interested that you sometimes get dragged into that world where people want your opinion. Yeah. How do you avoid that and and try and move people into that valley of humility? I'm excited about the other space. I'm not excited about opinions about anything. Every answer I give, people can talk about often that it comes a bit in riddle form or it sounds like you're messing around or you're dotting around the question. But the thing is, is though, as soon as you give absolute clarity, for me, there's no interest there. I'm not interested in stamping a mark on a moment. It does nothing for me. In terms of 
everything's a work in progress. Now, for where I want to go in my life, that I have direction, but I don't have a an opinion. Every opinion, you know, like we were saying before, we had a chat however long ago, and the reason that I think I listened to it and still enjoyed it was because I didn't really say anything. And I don't mean I didn't yeah, say anything. Yeah. I just didn't. I didn't put my marker down. And where I did, without really knowing, is the bit where I'm here saying, "Wow, that's where I've moved on." I've never moved on to a clearer answer. I've moved on to more space. Now, the danger when you have an opinion is you move on to an even stronger opinion. Yeah. And as someone said beautifully to me, it's like, beware of your opinions, for it's you that suffer them. It's a great the same The same way that someone says, you know, it's like feeling envy or hate or whatever is like drinking poison, hoping that someone yeah. else is going to suffer the effects. It's not, I don't do it because I think, oh, I'm going to suffer this opinion. But when I've had an opinion... I look and I think, how does it feel to have a strong opinion? Does it feel anywhere as good as when you feel open? <laughs> no, it's not even close. Yeah. So why do we want an opinion? And again, talking about Bernardo Castro was in this saying that it seems to be, he, he sees it in a way of like that many people, as we all do, feel a sense of we have got no idea what's going on. And it's so destabilizing to know that maybe none of this belongs to us, that your only way of getting a kind of one up on it is to at least be like, I understand it. I can't do anything about it, but at least I understand it. So you try and get some closure on every moment by having a, an opinion on it. Yeah. That's why it happened, how it happened, and how it should be. And, and even about me, I shouldn't have done that, but at least I've got a clarity. You don't do anything about it with that opinion, but at least you've got some sort of closure that makes you feel like a bit more of a yeah, me versus life. Like, that's not a goal, but it, at least I'm, you know, I'm making some inroads. But it's funny that, that it happens, because I think opinions are like that and I think that's the thing about opinions is to be humble enough to say this is how I feel right now and to start it always with the fact I don't know but this is how I feel right now and the humility to be able to say you know I feel differently now but we all I think feel like we get held by what we say and I think that the other thing about this is that that humility around an opinion when you look at I'm going to make this call and if I'm going to be very very stern on an opinion about someone else, what I would prefer is to have had the opportunity to know every single atom and cell of their being before I do it. And if I've got a spare couple of billion years, then I'll make that opinion. But if I haven't got that, then how much do I know? Well, I've just seen them play a game. So I've, I, the guys I work with in the, the, with the rugby is that I meet them and I don't have any opinion on them i don't know them if you said what sort of guy is that person or what sort of lady is that person i'd be like i don't know yeah i know but you've spent every day with them yeah 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 i have and I know nothing but what do you do i turn up and i meet them and i just storyless just go right where do we start how's life yeah i feel like this anything yeah did you feel pretty good yeah i do anything going on and as he's talking you're like ah the session's coming now i can feel it and then they're sort of pointing you and you're pointing it and you get what you want. But if I go in there and say, right, you're this kind of person, I know this because we met that many times ago, so you need to do this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. do you want to know how my days go? Not really. Do you parent in that same way? Or do you uh, feel you are entitled to more of an opinion? No, no completely the same way. In the, to have some sort of ownership over, just because I've seen, I, I did see this on a... Um, I mean, it seems very strange to go straight from this to parenting to children to what I'm about to say, but so it's not related in that respect. But I saw Caesar Milan on his dog show, um, and he was he was talking about they were talking about this dog that just seemed to be really angry. Yeah, and he said, but the thing is, is that this dog might have had some really difficult traumas in its early life, but the dog wants to be free, and you guys keep turning up with the same story about the dog. And it behaves to your story. And the, he says, so you've got to let go of the dog's story so the dogs can go. And I'm looking at my parenting saying, well, I want my child to be all she can be. And as soon as I start placing a story on who she is, that will start taking care of who she can be. But I want it to be all like she can be. So just I look at her for inspiration. I'm like, well, how, how should I do that? Well, I'll look at 
my daughter, you know, she, we have a bit of a moment where she's like, oh, I, want, I didn't want you to do that. And I'm going, oh, sorry, I thought you wanted to do that. And she's all upset. Yeah. 20 seconds later, she's like, daddy. How like, old is she? You've, she's three and a half. So she, you'd be like, oh, so you've forgiven, forgotten and let go. It's like, what about you? Well, I'm an adult. So we take three or four days before we're willing <laughs> yeah. to get over a grudge on someone. What about as they get older, though? I mean, our kids are at the age of, you know, exams at school and you know being tested by the system by their teachers how do we deal with that i mean our daughter my wife will kill me for saying it's just had a bad maths exam result now that's like dominating the thoughts now in our house how are we going to solve this problem about her maths well it's like this podcast causes me untold issues because in my head i'm looking at my wife thinking just let the story unfold let's just see where this goes and let's encourage her to be her and obviously everyone else is going, right, additional maths work, put them on a different pathway, do a maths intervention. All and it's so hard then to be the only one in the room going, guys, let's just let this thing play out. Yeah. I, I mean, I use Dylan Hartley's response. I, I don't have children um, any older than the age I've got, and I only have our child. We have our child. We don't have anyone else's. So it's, it's I can't put myself in that space. But I heard... Um, one of the, the guests, not on, on my podcast, but on another one, he did say, you know, talking about kids were asking about university and exams and he said, but you go into the exam beforehand and and surely you, you're outside the room and what you know, you know, what you don't, you don't. What else is there? But of course, we're out there with the textbook trying to flip through the last <laughs> few words, be like, maybe there'll be a question on this. But of course, if you, in life, is it not the same that you say, right, well, what do we know about how the future is going to turn out? Nothing. Mm. All right, so leave that as unknown. And what do we know? We know that we actually know very little. We know that you're, you're, you're happy. We know what we've got here and now. And that's, when you've got right here and now, it's difficult to sum up in a happening because a happening is taking place over time. When you describe events, it's always like a running of things. But if you go to the right here and now, what have you got here and now? You've got a being. And I think that's as far as you can go as what do we know. And then when you know that being, you're like, I can't even tell you how I know it because as soon as I open my mouth, I'm speaking out of my, out of my lane. And it's a real humbling experience to be like, what do you really know about now? Nothing. Because as soon as you say, well, Rupert Spira, the first guest I spoke to said this, he said, um, try to describe yourself without referring to the past in any way. Brilliant. It's, but it's amazing, isn't it? And now you say, well, what have we got here and now? Yeah. Well, you can't go to a story then. Should we listen to him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a different clip, yeah. but yeah, go for it. The question being, what is a life well lived and how would you paint that picture? I think a life well lived would be a life where we've had the courage to face all these feelings of lack, fear, sorrow, anxiety, and so on, instead of uh, avoiding them, suppressing them, that we'd had the courage to, to, to face them, to explore them, and to penetrate through them, to go through them, to find a sense of yourself that, that lies prior to that, and then to allow that understanding to then inform yeah. one's thoughts and feelings and one's subsequent activities and relationships. So it would be a life where we, we cease avoiding, suppressing, compensating, we first have the courage to turn around and face the thing that we are fleeing from. Yeah, okay. To face it, uncomfortable as it is. It's not going yeah, to be peaceful, pretty. You're not going to sit there with a beaming smile no. on your face. It's, it's uncomfortable. Having the courage to stay there uh, and, and then to slowly sink down deeper than that, to go through, back through the layers of discomfort, the feeling, to, to make touch with this essential sense of self or being and then to allow that to begin to inform our thoughts and feelings and, and the way we live and, and act and relate in the world whatever that would mean for each of us same sense of being but expressed differently in every single person's case yeah maybe it's not too dissimilar to what do here's a good call from you it's, it's bang on what we're talking about and that what happens if your next relationship was inspired by the unknown in you rather than inspired by what you think you know about someone else? I mean, imagine the possibility of meeting someone you, th 
you've met every day, but meeting them and letting the unknown see what, what they're about. Which we never... I, no. I'm thinking now, I don't think I've ever done that in my life. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But you see everyone with a preconceived plan of what no, you're going to talk exactly, about, what yeah. the meal's going to be To a like. degree, what you want out of them. Oh, whether you uh, want yes. them to feel a certain way about you, think a certain way, or, or whether you want them to take on your burdens and whatever it is. See, that reminds me, though, that was, like, again, like one of the things that, like, that getting comfortable with discomfort, yeah. as Rupert said was a really interesting reaction to our first conversation, Johnny, because I had people come to me and say, um, like, criticise and say, what Johnny was talking about there was the teachings of Eckhart Tolle and you should have pursued it to a deeper level. And <laughs> I'd, ne I'd never heard of Eckhart Tolle, yeah, first okay. of all. That so, may be why you didn't pursue this. Yeah, thing. so, I did, but I went and read about it, I read some of his stuff. But what was really interesting was people wanted to give it a label. They couldn't just be comfortable with this is you sharing your learning. It had They had to have a label or a title or something that they could go and then pigeonhole. And I'm interested again, at like, how do you deal with that where people want to take you as that previous story and pigeonhole you? They're comfortable with you being a former England rugby player rather than the person you are today. Yeah, I think, I think in a way, whatever interactions I have with people, I feel like if you take away the story, and we're going back to that deep honesty that we had with, you know, how do you really feel about someone else? And then you can find out what's actually causing the dynamic between you. But in the same way, the deep honesty about really taking away the story, remove every part of the story, then surely the story goes back to all the labels that have been put on anything. So I have to start with the fact that I think you guys are both men. Well, hold on, that's a label. At some point, everything's a label. So you guys are of a certain age. Well, that's another idea. You're of a certain form. It's like, but all of this is, so what am I left with? Now, when I'm left with basically an understanding that I don't just know nothing as in like, well, you're two guys of about this age. I just don't know anything about you. It's like, no, I don't know about what a guy is. So already that's changing my view of life. If I meet a woman and I meet a man, I'm slightly biased not how do you how do you f let go of all that stuff though because it's so everywhere and in us all the time even so but, but i think it happens when you speak to someone and you become deeply connected it goes you're no longer thinking i'm speaking yeah. to a 42 year old person who has been through this and played rugby for england and done this and did this and has this and is now into this stuff and you're kind of like it's irrelevant the same yeah. way that when you're on the field performing in the in the zone you're not thinking i'm in the field on the field in front of 80,000 people with two teams and the scores this you're like none of that exists you're not thinking there's a a, a man running this ball next to me and and he's this age and, and he looks like this you're like it's irrelevant so it's actually there you don't have to kind of like with your eyes like remove that so that you see something else but i've mentioned this before having a chat with a few people where and even talking about children you, you speak and you realize that it's so limiting to think you're talking to a child because with that is these sort of innate understandings that this is only a three and a half year old. It's just a child. So you go in there with the old, hello, how are you? Sort of there. You're like, okay, this is an intelligent life form. Immense intelligence. That hasn't been created three years ago. You don't just create beings out of nothing. This life form has been around the same length as anyone else and is expressing things beautifully through this. Now, what turns you off really engaging is this that first idea that, oh, you're a little child, aren't you? You're probably like whatever it is you think children do. But when you listen, you look, there's intelligence everywhere. And we do it with people. You look around, you maybe sort of see someone, you think, well, pigeonhole them a bit. Yeah, maybe what they're doing or, or who they're speaking to or what they're buying from the shop or whatever it is. It's ludicrous. But, it gives so much more freedom, actually, if you approach life like this. Though, but the connection you get, yeah. you realise that every form is serving you to be in your path. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there. And so when you say people make comments to me like that, I'm sort of like, but it's a, there's a brilliant opportunity here because it is supposed to be happening. Of all my life of what could be happening, this is where I am with this person. Anything else could be happening, but this is happening. So before we meet up today and record this, do you think, what would we talk about? What do I want to hear from you? You just... No, I'd sort of refuse the... The, the there's a few to, things I need to know on yeah. the paper just so I can I can <laughs> I can not sort of like ruin the interview. Yeah. But at the same time, no, I I don't want to hear questions before I 
before I hear them. Because otherwise, I'm going to give you an answer. It's the old speech in the bedroom mirror. But even down to like our connection, do you think about, oh, right, I remember them. He, he works on the telly. He's a professor. Do you, no. You don't put people in boxes like that at all? Irrelevant. So, to, so if we were to ask you the question that Rupert asked you at that interview, how would you describe you? Describe me? Yeah. Yeah, oh, sorry, the, yeah, the, about yeah, the, yeah, without... he asked me about the past. Yeah, I mean, what can you say? Nothing. There's nothing you can say. Everything is past. And if you go to any label, you're off. And so, again, we spoke to people on the podcast about saying that language belongs to the past. It's a, a limited format for trying to express the unlimited. And therefore, as we say, whenever you're in the zone, no one's ever like, oh, can you hear me talking? I'm in the zone right now. Can you hear me? This is amazing. <laughs> Look at me talking. I'll tell you what it's like where I am. It's like, no, there's silence. And that's not just meaning, right, you can't be in the zone because you could be talking, but you don't talk about being in the zone. That part is silent. You can be fully engaging in a chat like we are and feel like you're really in the moment. But as soon as you try and talk about the zone, you come out of the zone. But then what I'm interested in is that like a shared guest that we've both had is Dr. Wrong and Chatterjee. Yeah. And we covered some similar areas where he spoke about the like how limiting labels can be. So he spoke about the idea of him yeah. being a, a doctor or even a father. Suddenly you've got a label on it that what happens if you struck off or your children grow up. So he spoke about this idea of labeling himself as a curious creature. Like how... How do you feel around that idea of almost giving yourself adjectives about who you are in that moment? So I'm curious, I'm open, I'm humble. But all of those are their best efforts, I think, aren't they? It's something which gives boundaries without boundaries. The things that they're sort of self-defeating. So curiosity is like, so what does curiosity mean? It means that you've never made your mind up. So you're someone that is not really any, what you're telling me is something without telling me anything. And they're kind of like really close tools for being i need to give you something limitless and that's why i said about acceptance is a brilliant one because people say i just can't accept that okay can you accept that you can't accept it yes <laughs> acceptance always wins it's it's impossible to beat acceptance the same way the same way with awareness can you be aware i, I just i'm just feeling like this can you be aware of that feeling yes i can can you be aware of being aware of that feeling? And then you're into that space of being like, whoa, now we're going right there. But can you respond to this? Yeah, I can. It doesn't matter how. It's like, yes, I can. It's the whole point of human lives are about responding. Responding to the energy state, who they are in that moment. All of those things I would use to, to define because they're infinite. But in terms of how would I describe me, I go to Rupert's thing quite quickly because otherwise we're back to that idea. It's an opinion. I'm giving you an opinion about me and my opinion, as soon as I say it, I'm going to go, oh, I hate it. <laughs> Move it on. <laughs> you know, like I have that with writing books. I wrote books a while back and I've written them and, and I'm, like, I'm not interested in reading them. Why not? Because what well, I could do if you wanted, but I'm just like, because when it's there in paper, people really like to say, well, I've read your book. So I know all about the life you had. You're like, no, you don't ask me now. And they'll be like, but this isn't in your book. So of course it's not. That was just so then and there but when that becomes when people you know i think 20 years on they're still going here's my book i'm sort of thinking oh, i as soon as i wrote that book within about a few months i was like oh no i'd well, love to say last time that you you felt that there was a spike of mental health increases because of the of young men that would have read that book and believed about the sacrifice and the struggle was was where it was at yeah and a lot of that mental health probably coming from the fact of i don't have that obsessive passion therefore you know i'm not going to achieve anything or success or or that as well so not just the you know this obsessive passion and and refusing to yield and i wrote something in that book that was a, what's the point of doing anything if you don't want to be the best at it i mean i wrote that <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe? It's mad, isn't it? Yeah, but you believed it at the time. Of, of course, yeah. But looking at it now, you're sort of thinking, there's a load of kids yeah. in there playing rugby, being like, well, that's that then. Because I'm, I'm just doing in. this for fun. Yeah. I'm having a great time. And it's sort of like, it's, it's just a reflective of the state you were in. Because if you'd have said, all right, well, why, why do you play tennis then? Oh, because uh, I love it. Yeah. Well, you shouldn't, though, because you don't want to be the best at it, do you? 
all right yeah i see what you mean you kind of like <laughs> yeah there's a lot more to life than and that's just an opinion like i said it, it's not a good or a bad opinion but the fact that it's opinion and it's wrapped up with a bow on it just makes you go right well i'm not really interested in it anymore it's so limited whereas life is is this constant expanding and challenging and transcending of barriers to think that you're going to enclose it all it does is as you when you enclose yourself you sort of go right this is who i am the life in you just goes i want to come out and you feel it pushing on you in all kinds of emotions as soon as you say right if someone says to you right choose whatever you do now this has to be you for the rest of your life whatever you choose you're like i don't want to make this choice so why would you do it with your idea of who you are and then feel you have to stick to it. Yeah. And who anyone else is. It's a good reminder that you never really know anyone. You know, we'll all go back to our wives this evening. They'll be different people. Absolutely. To yeah. the ones that we left this morning. We yeah. don't know what they've been through today, no, what no. they've seen, what they've heard. They haven't heard this conversation. We're yeah. different as well. And that's, yeah. I guess that's why so many people get into such a muddle in a relationship because they go, well, I know you. Mm. So don't start changing because I fell in love with the, yeah. or I became mates with the person that I knew. And now, you you know, you, you they'll be friends from rugby that you're no longer... Mm. friends with so to speak because they will look at you and they won't like where you've gone they'll find it challenging or confusing yeah. or, or they'll disagree with it I think just on that point you were talking about with, with children as well it's quite interesting that you kind of have all your kind of things that you find difficult in life and your insecurities and the things like that and then quite often you'll see in children they, they pick up on some of that because of the way they are when they're around you or maybe they have some of it innately passed on or whatever it is and you kind of go wow I have this I think you might have some of this and you kind of go, what a beautiful way to collaborate with your child to say, we've got a lot of the same stuff. We can go on this journey together. But what we end up doing is being like, I'm going to use my insecurity to cause more of it by sort of saying, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. And what if this happens? You're kind of like, but actually there's such an opportunity there to say with humility rather than here's some stuff that never worked out for me. Why don't you have it? <laughs> Do your best guess, but you could be like, I'm I'm on the, I'm a work in progress here, and I'm, what I'm seeing in you in the these stages now is that you're you're so much more powerful. I mean, how are you doing it? No one asks the child. You know how how do you how come you have so much fun the whole time? Why do you look at that and just think about playing the whole time? Yeah, yeah. And what we say is, oh, we haven't got a job, have you? But then you put a child in a in a in a place where they go right. You have to sit there and eat your dinner, and they're playing again. Yeah. The same way someone says you have to sit there in an office and phone that person. You're kind of like, why can't we play? Yeah. Why can't we have some fun around it? I said to Florence last night, because I'm an adult and I know best. <laughs> and now I wish I had not said, because A, I'm an adult, and B, I know best. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't. Um, let's hear, actually, what Rong and Chatterley had to yeah. say on our podcast. I've done a lot of work on my identity. I don't even identify anymore as a father or as a doctor. And I think that surprises people. So I think identities can be limiting for us. So if I say... I'm a doctor and I'm a father, and to be clear, I'm very proud of both of those things, then what happens, let's say I get fired from a job as a doctor, let's say I get sick and I can't work, if my identity is wrapped up in being a doctor, I've got a problem, I'll start to feel worthless. As a father, if who I am as a father, then what happens when my kids leave home, right? What happens if my kids shout at me when they're teenagers and we have a row and they say, you're a crap father, right? This happens. I've got patients like this where they, they feel worthless because their whole identity is wrapped up in that. So those are roles that I play. They're not who I am. And what I think is a useful exercise for everyone is to, in the book I call it the identity menu, where you go through, I've listed about 15 values or so. It's not an exhaustive list. Yeah. But really try and identify what are your core values. So for me, I've done this exercise on many occasions. My three core values are integrity, curiosity, and compassion. Those are the values I try and bring into everything I do. So when I'm a father, am I living by those values? When I'm a doctor, am I living by those values? When I'm on the High Performance Podcast, interacting with you two, Am I living by those values? Because then if I am, that's what I can take around with me in my back pocket, no matter what happens in life. Do, do, does that, do that yeah, make yeah. sense? I suppose the key thing to say there, though, is you can have those values, but they have to constantly change based on the conversation we've been having for the last hour or so. I think so. I, th I think, I think <laughs> being involved in professional sport 
every year you'd have that team meeting where you go right we're going to redefine our values and it'd be stuff you'd write on the change room wall or whatever and it, it, the thing is is if you went around the league you pretty much see the same wall and so much of it because of the nature of it when you go to that deep honesty because that's not really necessarily acceptable to be deeply honest you often find people going right hold on what does the coach want me to say here passion honesty yeah, you know, and these kind of things and commitment and whatever it be but really there's only probably one is that is this revealing my potential is this about me being all i can be and then you but then you you need to come to an understanding of what that is and even still it's so complex that you need something there that to be accountable to for me is kind of some of the stuff that's come up the podcast is just am i trying to solve this or am i opening to it and yeah. i think that that's 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 every experience. it doesn't mean that you never respond because you know the difference between something that needs doing you know kind of right i need to get on the tube and you think oh i'm a bit of i'm in a bit of a rush you don't stop in the middle of the run to the tube and go am i experiencing this or am i you you rush to the tube you know it's been done but when you get that old emotion in you that's like anxiety or whatever and there isn't that physical threat there there's an opportunity there to say, right, just like before a game, I don't want to feel this way. What am I doing about it? And I think having some clear ideas that can get people in that space, but even still, it's so subjective to how that moment is, how people are feeling, because you can be angry and operate through anger as long as everyone's open to it. One of the most moving responses we've had uh, on the podcast was when we interviewed Rob Baxter and I'd be interested in your view on this given what we're talking about those values that people stick on the wall and he said that for him a seminal moment as a head coach was to ask himself the question would I want my child to come into this environment that I'm responsible for and when we asked him his answer to that he said well for the first five years of my coaching it frightened me that the answer would be no I wouldn't and then once he became comfortable with the discomfort of that, it led him to create a very different environment that he said, the last seven years, I'd, I'd be happy to give the answer yes. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I, I think that going back to that deep honesty side of it is underpinning all that coaching side, there has to be a question of, do you really care about your team? And do you care about, really care about every single player? whether or not they're playing, whether this one's just done this, and or is it conditional? And when, when you can say, I oh, honestly care, players don't need anything else. As much as they're saying, I need more communication, I need more this, I need more that, it's such a long list of things that they can say, I, I need this, because you're trying to find the answer to why I don't feel right, but when someone you know they really care about you, suddenly your list goes, no, you're right, <laughs> good, 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 no, actually I just realised that was all because I just, couldn't trust that you care about me and to come to that level of caring is tough because you know you've got your we need to win and working backwards from that who's going to get me the win who's playing well at this and you, it's difficult all these people that some of them might slide off and when they slide off you know they're like oh, hold on not talking to me so there goes the communication need to communicate but if you're aware that when a player walks past you you care about them and you go how are you doing and your mind, whatever, you pull over here, like we were saying before, you matter. You matter. I've just seen you. How's your day? You know, how's your family going? You're right. Is there anything I can get you? But not that kind of stuff that's out of a book where you like ask each player this and it yeah. will get you, you know, like mean it. Mm. And the only way to, to mean it is that is you've got to get, like you said, that deep honesty to realize that if I don't like someone, it's for me, not them. Yeah, I know, but they've done this. It's like, yeah, but why do I have an issue with that? Because, you know, we were speaking before on the, podcast before when your child does something yeah that you're kind of like oh right well yeah but then within 10 minutes you're like oh come here but someone else does it you're like right that's that's done why can't you give that to someone if and because you're sort of like well with my family we're a team yeah but that's your team that's your secret to all of the the material success you want it's right there and you're kind of like yeah i know but he, but he did that didn't he it's like yeah he did and do you know what he was going through when he was doing that no idea, right? But you're willing to base a judgment on it that's just self-harming, yeah. based on that. And I think, for me, that 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 do you really care is a big question that I would ask myself the same thing. 
sometimes you can see people you're like well this is not about them it's about me definitely well you know one of the things i've enjoyed most about sitting and having this conversation is like i've actually got quite a nice sense of freedom from it a reminder that having an opinion is handcuffing yourself and actually not having an opinion is freeing not putting people in boxes is freeing not having a preconceived idea of what you're going to get out of someone or even how they're going to react to what you say is totally freeing right so we all care deeply about our wives and our parents and our siblings and our kids and those others that are really like really close so do we have a responsibility to make them feel like this because it it is helpful and i know my wife for example there's areas here where she absolutely w wouldn't doesn't go there yeah. and i wish she would so should we put it on them and say no think like this <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then it's the it's the same issue is that this m might feel like a great shift in your life but mm. why is it a great shift in someone else's so do you try and share all this with your wife and i we i speak honestly about what i feel about things i never am in the position of saying you know this might help you i'm kind of like well, how would i know that so what i can say is oh um so what are you feeling about this i feel this but i have no i don't come at it from the same stance as you so you know it's a bit like a, a, you're running a hundred meter, and you think I'm running faster than, or I'm, I'm beating this next person. You're like, but for a start, you don't all start in the same place. Secondly, you're not all running the same direction. No one's running in a straight line. So now, say who's being who? You're kind of like, well, this person's been running for about five weeks. But I think we should encourage them though, because <laughs> I it think, might. I think I think take them somewhere, but then they can choose. I think the, the thing I find interesting is there's a power in not finding an answer yeah and becoming comfortable with that whereas what i think can somehow be imposed albeit from a societal perspective is that there's an answer and when you find it you move on but that answer is the next problem and it's normally the same problem over and over again that coming to that different relationship which we said last time with the unknown is where all the strength is the strength isn't in having the answer because then if you say, right, the conditions are such that that answer is no longer available, you're like, I'm done. I'm completely lost now. But someone that says the answer is just no answer, you're like, well, you're always okay. I think with education and such, like we're promoting the idea that there's an answer to society, there's an answer to being a success, there's an answer to winning in life, there's an answer to being happy. And I think the actual answer is no answer. And that no answer for us adults means unlearning. For the children, it means remaining playful. Because where there's playful, there isn't that severity of things. You know, it's a bit like Ron was saying about identities. Is when you when you can play with your identity a bit and self-efface, meaning you know, in a general, a genuine way, and sort of say, "Oh, you're this, this, this," with humility, you can play with you. So you can let that identity go. Here's a new one. I'm going to try this one out. Try this shirt out for size. Yeah, quite enjoyed that. Oh, yeah take that one off new one on but when you get strong about your identity you've got that shirt on you're like no one's taking this off and then life comes along and rips it off and you're sort of like oh my god what am i going to do now but taking time as rupert said he actually used the analogy on his thing about being clothed is that you take those clothes off and you go do you know what nothing's more liberating we're well, getting into a dark space of the metaphor here. <laughs> <laughs> Just tread but, careful here, John. <laughs> actually, that leads us nicely Can't onto a, table, yeah. that it's, leads it's us nicely good. onto a question from a viewer um, who says, "What does Jolly do physically to be all he can be? Now he no longer has to for his job physically." Mm. There's my brother and I work on this uh, or, or look at this loads. He's a he's a fitness condition. That's very much his side, and he's he's really interested and excited in this. So we look at it in the way that you've got kind of diet nutrition stuff so how you feed your body because ultimately what you put in your body is what creates your body and your body's constantly regenerating and building itself out of what you eat so to think that your eyes and your senses are not related to the food you've eaten is mad most people think oh it's yeah I'm building up my muscles i need to do that and get my blood thinner and moving faster or whatever you're kind of like no, no everything your whole body is food and food choices so it's an important one um, the the other part would be breathing. Yeah, it's been said a lot that you know we can last so long without food, so long without water, and without breathing. You're like huge, huge part of breathing. Look in the spiritual traditions; so much around breathing is the secret to 
deeper dimensions of of awareness and experience and then um movement so how you hold yourself posturally and and then in terms of your your exercise and what you do for the the body in that respect and the last one would be sort of restfulness you know like sleep recovery but also just meditation those kind of things so those four pillars and in order that they can all expand and grow at once there needs to be that middle part which is getting out of your own way because whilst you have this idea about how it should be suddenly all right my movement and now i'm doing my move my exercise and then suddenly you're doing your crazy exercise regime that you can't bear to miss because this is how it has to be and then all of a sudden your breathing's gone because your stress is out, your restfulness is gone because you're overworking your body and you can't stop thinking about where you should be when you're trying to sleep or whatever. So understanding that balance to get out of your own way, all of those four can expand together. When you stay in your own way, you'll push one over here, which will contract the others. And you just shift, you stay as the same volume, but you just change shape. More breathing, yeah, but all the rest stays there. More sleep, yeah, but all the rest stays here. But to expand the four, getting out of that own way and, and what that means for me is being life fit no longer aspirational fit so aspirational fit was like rugby fit yeah. you see a lot of fit people in rugby but not a lot of healthy people because huge amounts of aspirational stuff i'm going to run for ages and i can sprint and stop and sprint and stop and lift weights and you're like yeah great but what about getting in and out of a car what about bending down to play with your daughter what about you know sort of sitting down and relaxing for 10 minutes and staying quiet and having proper rest well no can't do that so well, what does life involve life's a whole variation of different things underpinned by restfulness the biggest one which is another way of saying get out of your own way and on top of that everything else is flowing and graceful so i look at it as more what would i do to prepare myself physically i try and be the most flowing graceful version of whatever i need to be so if i need to get in the car I like to do it in a way that you barely hear or see it. I don't like to do it in a way of like, oh my god, oh jeez, <laughs> yeah. like yeah. And and I I like that because it involves, as my brother would say, you got to do strength work as well. People think, well, I'll get off the weights, but actually, resistance training hugely important. Movement, stretching, you know, breathing techniques, looking at what you eat, brilliant, and it all can turn into a life where you flow through life and i'm interested like i was moved when you told us that example of training at two in the morning so you could fit in being a parent how do you go about monitoring that life fitness now and making sure that you're in that flow so for me the the difficult thing with training is that i'm excited and passionate about it there's a huge but at the same time when it crosses the line and you can see there's detrimental effects there's something else at play where there's irrationality there's something at play what is it what is it that keeps you doing that is it this idea that oh well i used to be like this, this is how people see me and i want to be like this and i'm not fit and healthy unless i look like this mm. amazing amounts of things in that for me most of the time now what i do is i i probably way more than i kick balls i shoot basketballs all the time and i do and i get all my coaching techniques out of that or i'll hit a tennis ball against the wall and i'll do it for hours and I'll do it purely deeply engaged all through what we're talking about here in terms of that feeling realm and connecting the body and the ball as one and, and, and having it through intention and how intention can realize itself in the same moment, how you can get mind image to actual image and how close they get and how that relates to feel. It's just like, for me, I'm like, oh, leave me in here and you won't see me again for a week. Um, but at some level, whenever it crosses a line where it impacts upon health and wellness it's self-harming so how do you monitor that is it your wife or is it is how do i monitor the voice so how do i monitor that um same way so looking for attuning awareness to symptoms so you know like feeling but much more acutely than the one where you get up and go oh, i've got a bad back yeah but more just being aware of kind of all right i feel slight fatigue in the afternoons I'm not sleeping quite as well. I'm waking up in the morning a bit like this. When I go to bed, I'm coming alive at, at 12, 1 o'clock. Now, where's that coming from? What am I eating? Where am I eating? What's my training been doing? Where have I been? My body been suddenly lifting up because I'm training a lot more at 9 o'clock at night. And now it's lifting up at that time. So when I'm not training, I'm suddenly like, wow, I've got a buzz at this time. And things like I'd never have even 
being he's lying in bed and be like, why can't I sleep? But now the awareness is a lot more tuned in to just picking up those subtle things that say, oh, you know, for example, you know, meditating is a really good one. You sit there and you kind of become aware of the tiniest tension. And I always get it in my right forearm. And no matter how everything else relaxes, ever so slightly, it just holds. And it's it's amazing because you'd be like, well, I'd never have noticed that. But when you sit quietly, you start to become aware of so much more breathing-wise, depth-wise. And when we did our interview before, when you said listen to it again, what's the main thing I I listened when I heard was my energy, my breathing rate, the cadence of my speaking, not to do with what I was saying. That was the most interesting thing to me. Don't get me wrong, I, I did say to you guys, I love the way that you shaped the interview and everything and the, and the podcast, but that's the thing that stands out most.
adaptation gap. You know, like, this is where I am, this is where I want to be in the future, and I must go through what it is I don't have to get to where I want to be. And if I don't have it, I can't decide what it's going to be. I have to properly give over. And again, all these messages correlate so beautifully to a higher intelligence that I'm asking to. I'm asking for the The studies come emerging from other hunter-gatherer populations that suggest that these very quick, short bursts of sudden feeling like that, not just physically, but emotionally and mentally, can actually bring benefits in the long run. So we've, we have created a lifestyle that sees this feeling as being toxic or harmful, when actually it's, it's very important for brain growth and the fact that you say you feel good in that situation and you always come out of that feeling you have learnt or you have grown or you have advanced is actually evidence that that's what it does. So when you look at trauma as an isolated uh, topic, there is something known as post-traumatic growth, which is now being more and more widely studied in the populations in China and in Japan after the natural disaster, so the earthquake and the tsunami. And there is definitely evidence that people who come through trauma and who do the right thing so that they actually remove themselves from the physiological state of the actual trauma itself, they recover physically. They certainly have a psychological tendency for greater resilience. And we talked about wisdom and wonder earlier. I think with age or with life experience, you're exposed to more and more situations of being in an unknown situation, having an adaptation gap, and learning that actually this adaptation gap is comfortable, can be made comfortable, should be accepted, and can lead to a good outcome afterwards. Which is why, again, there are some, but there's some light size that show that people who are older do have better tolerance for these stressful situations. So becoming comfortable with uncertainty and feeling in that zone and accepting it can bring huge benefits. What a lovely optimistic clip. It's beautiful. Spend that? our lives running away from yeah. potential problems. But we keep putting ourselves in a situation, as she says a bit in the podcast as well, that where the challenge we we put ourselves in it must exceed our confidence in order for it to be an adaptation. And it's so funny, we keep putting ourselves in these situations because deep deep down we want to feel it. We want to go beyond our confidence so we can grow. But then when we get there, I mean, it's a classic for rugby, you know, you kind of, you get in the change room, you spent your whole life preparing for this. And two minutes before the game, if someone goes, oi, back door, you can leg it. Mm. You'd be like, I think I might. <laughs> because you, you don't realise that that's the point though. You're supposed to be beyond your confidence and it's a great place to be. The only thing is, is when you try and control your way through the adaptation, as I've said with me occasionally, trying to play it between six or eight on a level of safety by saying I won't go for too much because I don't want to fail. But the whole point is, is to say, right, I want this, I'm going for it, it feels uncomfortable, what am I going to do? I'm going to let go and just give all of me to it. But this may happen, yes it may, but I want the adaptation. And I have to listen to what's around me to get it. I can't keep listening to the me, because the me is basically saying, I haven't got this. Mm -hmm. So stop looking at me for the answer, because if you do, you're going to get more of the same. <laughs> and we're going to end up where we are, and we're going to have to go through this again. And I think, I, I think it's, it's awesome to have it looked at differently. And also to say that that trauma, trauma, when people sort of go through the sitting and the thing, it results in wisdom and, and wonder, and that it actually results back to the childlike state. 
it's almost like you, your childhood gets interrupted by the trauma and sent on this path and you go back to the childlike playful state and you can have that again, but this time with a greater conscious understanding which allows you to, you know, to explore it further. I think it's, it's a nice thing that most people say, life gets harder when you get older. It's nice to hear someone say, well, mm. why should it? You face more adaptation gaps, you give in more and more, you grow more, you get more comfortable in that space, you get a greater momentum going. You're kind of like, it sounds good to be getting older if you ask me. Final clip, what are you going to go for, Damien? Well, based on that conversation, I'd like to share the Johanna Conter clip because she spoke really powerfully, didn't she, that she'd almost, she'd, she'd spent a life invested in that struggle that you described, the idea that I... You know, like the Albert Ellis masturbation, I must be better, this must be the way, this should be the way it is. And she spoke about, she was about 144th in the world, if we want to label it, when she was introduced to a Spanish psychologist called Juan Cotto. And she, and that was the moment when she felt her career went on a different trajectory, because he shared with her a really simple formula. And the formula was um, struggle, times resistance equals pain so the point is that when you're facing a struggle during a game when you fight it and say it shouldn't be this way we must i must be better than this so he said if the struggle is 10 and you fight it at a 10 the pain is 100 okay yeah whereas if you surrender to it the pain will still be there but if you if you reduce it to a zero yeah the pain is zero yeah. so you enjoy it and you surrender to it i thought yeah that was a concept that took me back to our original yeah. interview but equally I, I, I use it myself yeah. in terms of times of struggle to embrace it rather than to fight it and it, it seems to me like Juan kind of unpicked a lot of things from the past and realigned things in your mind but almost more than that it sounds like he kind of said look it's okay to have anxiety and struggle and fear and to carry all of this but you can also carry it without being impacted by it you can you can live with it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I think it was it was understanding that actually whatever feelings that I'm feeling, whatever, um, however overwhelmed I feel, I'm actually fully equipped to deal with it. I'm yep. fully equipped to live through it. And I think it was with him that it, we, we also discussed that nothing's permanent. Nothing's a permanent state. It, everything keeps moving. And so I think that kind of gave me hope as well yeah. when I was feeling really down or overwhelmed, stressed, upset, anything, um, knowing that this is not going to stay like this. I, I will feel different at some point. And I think actually, um, let me just get it right in my head, but a formula that he gave me is um, pain times resistance equals suffering. So if I'm in pain, let's say at a 10, but and I'm, you know, resisting at a 10, and my suffering's going to be 100. Yeah. But if my resistance is zero, then my suffering's zero. And although, you know, there's probably variances in there, but to me that gave it a very practical, tangible kind of, Brilliant. kind of steps for me to take if I was feeling a certain way. I find that really interesting uh, and really powerful. She mentioned about the, you know, perfectly equipped to deal with it. And that change room thing I, I mentioned you know in the change room you're you're feeding back and me too Sereni was talking about this you're feeding back with your mind not with real life so you're in the change room you're going oh my god you know what if this happens and your mind's going Whoa, and it's answering itself whereas when you get on the field you feed back with the field and with the life and that's the now when you engage with the now with the life you've got it the feedback is, is there but when you're trying to go in the future feeling back with your own ideas about something, it's a, just a, a terrible cycle. So that whole idea again about being like, oh, it's so tough in the change, but when the whistle goes, I'm all right. It's like, well, when the whistle goes, you just start being the now you, whereas in the change room, you're trying to be the future you. Um, and the who we spoke to on the podcast, Sadhguru, he mentioned sort of a, a couple of things. One of them that really, really sort of I found um, very, very interesting I, i'm not on the podcast but i met him in person several years ago and we were talking to him and i said to him oh what's your um what about your physical routine it's, it's i sleep about two hours a night two and a half hours a night he's a 60 year old man he's, he's he said i sleep about two in 
as I'm getting a bit older, so maybe three now. And my wife trains me a nutritionist, just sort of straight away led forward and blurted out, how the hell do you recover then? Because, you know, we know what it's like. You don't get any sleep. You just, and he said, recover from what? And it was exactly what you said. When there's no resistance, there's no suffering. And what he said in that same part was that pain for the body's nothing. It can recover. It's what it's designed to do. You know, like Mitsu was talking about that stress, you know, have that stress, bits of pain in the body, you know, some small cuts and abrasions heal better. People use that as part of a technique. You're making small things to the body because it heals back even better. What he was saying is when the mind gets involved in pain, it becomes suffering. I think that's kind of what the point is here. The resistance is the mind getting involved and that becomes suffering. So he says without the mind, what is there to recover from on a night? So two hours, I'm done and I'm up being like, yeah, I feel good to go. But because we spend so much time in that mind-based thing, we need so much recovery to get to it. And as soon as we're up in the morning, what's the first thing we do? Straight back to it. You wake up and go, that was a nice sleep. Anyway, what's my phone doing? Yeah. Oh, geez, so this shouldn't, yeah, and you're off again. It's so powerful that old ideas, they're not equipped to deal with the now because they're out of date. But the now you, without the ideas, as we said, is perfectly equipped for anything. So whatever can't deal with it, it's just an old idea. And I think yeah, it's, it's so powerful that it's been rugby games we've had in the World Cup final, you know, the the final kick, you know, they sort of um, level the game out again and we're under the post thinking, hit it. We don't want to not lose this game, we want to win it. So go on, knock it over. And there's a total acceptance of like, you hit it, we're doing this. You don't, oh, we'll win it in normal times, fine. There isn't a resistance of like, oh no, he's hit it, what does that mean? It's just straightforward. Well, there's no resistance, go on, hit it if you want. And there's clarity with that. The clarity is just like, right, what are we going to do now? We'll do this. Because there's no old idea saying, well, what about me? Factor me in. You're just like, no, no. Yeah. I think it's the same thing when like Zidane and football or something. The pass goes over here and there's no like, hey, pass it to me here. It's almost like, well, hold on. He just says yes to that pass, whatever it is. And it ends up being something incredible that not even he could have imagined because the pass was slightly off. So because it goes off, he has to do this and does that and then it's kind of like, oh, I've surprised myself. But you say no to it, no to that pass, then what you get is nothing. You just get average. Whereas when you say yes to it, it's the doorway to everything. And yes to anger is a doorway to something you couldn't get to without the anger. It's a really, really powerful point. But again, the, the journey of saying, well, how do you drop the resistance? You're back to the same thing. It's like you've got to go into a space where you've got to, tune the awareness and the acceptance and become okay with whatever comes brilliant and a great way to end and a reminder i guess of a big theme in this conversation of getting out of your own way um i was just thinking as we were sitting here and talking aren't we lucky to be in a period where we're able to actually have these kinds of conversations and be able to share them with people and you have to go back five years and you could sit in your room and think about all of this but there was no there was nowhere to send it. There was nowhere to share it. There well, you was could, no feedback. You, could, you was... could write some really dogmatic books back in the day if <laughs> yeah, you wanted to. <laughs> this is what I believe. But it does feel like um, it feels like we're in a really interesting area at the moment, doesn't it? With this kind of opportunity. I think there's, there's been a, lots of people talking about a, a time of great shift and uncertainty, and whereas the, the the as you say, the dial might seem like it's moving this direction in certain areas, in other areas, it really isn't. I think the key though is that with all these types of movements that that they don't end up getting in their own way that they become identified as wrong and says with right this is the movement and this is what it is the same way that someone you know a messenger of the of, of the yonder years has a, a a message of true inspiration that says this is a beautiful way you know to approach life but people read into it with their own minds and go right there 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 create a doctrine which yeah. many years later is creating equal parts suffering yeah. but to to the, the message is never going to change for me from the fact that if you think you know where you're going it'll be what's stopping you getting to where you're supposed to be going the conflict is people say well what about your desires and your goals and wanting to achieve but those also come by getting out of your own way the clarity of what you really want your calling your passion your, your meaning your purpose in life for right now comes and you follow that through the intention and the dreamed image and the beauty of it but you just don't insist upon the image for how things must turn out. You 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 give the what, but you let go of the how and when. Yeah. The what is your lane, the how and the when, 
belongs to something bigger than you. Well, can I say, Johnny, on behalf of all our listeners, as well as Jake and myself, that like, I thank you to you for... But, like, I would label it courage. You might label it the vulnerability that, that you've had because we were talking earlier, I think you're the perfect messenger for this period of, of humanity that we exist in because you have scaled the mountain of your chosen first the first mountain of your career you've been there you've seen it and yet your message carries greater weight because then you've come back down and encourage us to explore and be vulnerable and be humble and see something different i think i think your example is incredibly powerful so thank you it really is i say genuinely it's my pleasure because it is my pleasure it's my absolute passion but i'm understanding almost, as you mentioned before, almost embarrassingly, or, or, or very hum, sort of humbling, uh, in a very humbling way, is that everyone you meet, you could, uh, yeah, I met my next door neighbour from over the road the other day, and I just took five minutes to be like, yeah, so, and we got talking, and I'm thinking, I could do a podcast on you right now. You're incredible. And yet, you live over the road, and no one, yeah, no one's writing your name in the paper, and inviting you to come on podcasts mm-hmm. and things. And just that's it's stunning, you know, with all of you guys. You you were speaking in the last podcast about your life with your family and not wanting to get back late. And I'm kind of thinking, there's so much going on with everyone. Everyone is doing everything they possibly can. And it doesn't matter what direction that seems to be or where we are. It's just like going back to that really caring thing. It's like everyone's given so much. And they all care and they all want to be here. It doesn't matter what it looks like. And I think representing that's really difficult I, I i don't like the idea that it comes across as you know well you know this is my story and whatever but just to pay back that humility to say i just enjoy genuinely if you said oh by the way these aren't on i'd be like i don't care <laughs> i don't care it's been awesome we've had two hours and you know and, and it seems strange because on my podcast i don't talk much you wouldn't know that from my other podcast because because <laughs> i go but i don't talk much and i sit there and just go oh Wow. Mm. And and just yeah, being here with you guys, it's it's reassuring to know that there's people offering opportunities and it's not like you said it in a way a Trojan horse where you're kind of like, Look at this amazing messages we're putting out. When are we getting the award? Are we getting the big award? You know, and, and when's that coming in? You're kind of like, Yeah, there is a goal to keep a business going and sustain it and everything, but it's just so nice that that comes first. Way before and if you did say, Oh, by the way, that's gone, you'd be like how can I still do this without running myself into bankruptcy? Yeah. You know, how can we still do this on some way? Because it's that that counts the same way with the rugby players. It's like, yeah, the trophy counts, but if you say, right, you can't have the trophy, but you can keep playing, you'd be like, yes, please. Don't, you know, I'll give up the trophy as long as I can have one more moment on the field. And I think, yeah, this is the joy of me is, is seeing you guys again. It's like the, basically like the last one hasn't stopped we've just carried on talking but we've got you know two different versions of ourselves having a crack so that's it for another episode of i am it's brilliant to be sharing this unfolding experience with you all if you'd like to get in touch with either me or the guest then all the information you need is in the show notes I welcome all and any feedback. I really want all of you to have a hand in guiding the feel of this show and the path of the conversation as well. So just keep them coming in. But until next time, I'm Johnny Wilkinson and this has been I Am. <laughs>